Hey, welcome to Fellowship Online. My name is Joel Diaz. I'm the Connections Pastor, and I am so thankful you've chosen to be with us. We are continuing in our journey through the book of Ephesians, and we find ourselves in chapter four. And this uh, section of our series, Pastor Jason has entitled, Walk Worthy. So looking forward to hearing what God has laid upon his heart. While we're worshiping together this morning, uh, you can go to the church website, or you can click on the QR code that you see on your screen uh, and connect with us there. Uh, while you're there, you can also have opportunities to give, to pray, and uh, to connect. So welcome again to Fellowship, and now let's worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. Good morning, Fellowship, and uh, good morning, Fellowship Online once again. Um, hey, we are excited that you are here in the Worship Center with us this morning. I want to remind you, this is a family-friendly service, so if you have children in here, we are glad your kids are in here. Uh, but we also want to let you know that we have some activities, uh, uh, kids' activities available for you. Uh, there's bags back here at these back tables here on the main floor, or if you're in the balcony over towards the stairwells, you will see a table with some blue bags there. And those are for you and your children to enjoy during our worship service this morning. If you are here for the first time or you're a returning guest and we have not had an opportunity to connect with you, we would love to do that. If you will please scan the QR code up on the screen or go to fellowshiproswell.org slash today. Um, that will take you to a, a list of links, but on there you'll see the connect card. Fill that information out and we'll simply just uh, reply with an email with a little bit more information about fellowship and next steps. Uh, if, you are, if you'd like to give this morning, uh, you can also do that at that link. And I just, as a pastor, want to thank you for your continued faithful giving um, as we continue to move forward into what God has called us to do here in Roswell and beyond. Um, Last week you heard a little bit from our children's minister, Hillary McCracken, about the new uh, database system and our app, Touchpoint. Uh, I did hear some feedback, so I want to make sure that I say this. To find our app, you just go to your app store on your phone and type in Fellowship Roswell with no space in between. All together, Fellowship Roswell, and it'll pop up right at the top of the list. Um, and so she shared a little bit about Touchpoint. Uh, this morning we're going to watch a video uh, that we filmed earlier this week. And I'm going to share with you a little bit more about Touchpoint and the registration process that's available on the app. So if you would please turn your attention to the screens. Thank you. Hey, Fellowship. Joel. I'm the Connections Pastor here, if we haven't met. And I'm excited to show you some more features about Touchpoint, specifically inside of the app and registering for events here on our campus or off campus if you have a student that needs to register for a uh, off-site camp or a retreat. And so what you wanna do is you just simply want to open up the app. You'll see right here, it says registrations. Click on that. And then I'm gonna register for First Look Tour. Go there and you'll hit the register now. It will open up into a secured section of the app that you have to set up a pin for. And then there's my name. And to, to register for this event, I just hit submit. I could add other family members if I'd like to. So let's register someone else. And I'm gonna add my wife onto this registration. So now it's both of us. I'm gonna submit. There we go, we're done. So now we are both registered. I hope you enjoy this little demonstration. I wanna encourage you to download the app. You can find it in the App Store by searching for Fellowship Roswell. And the next time that you have to register for an event or register your kids for an event, it's gonna be that much easier. Awesome, thank you, Joe. So we're all gonna go home and download this app, right? Yes, awesome. Hey guys, let's stand on our feet. Let me pray before we begin to worship our Lord together. Lord, we love you. We thank you for this gathering as we come into this place as brothers and sisters in Christ. We come before your throne. We declare that any battle that we may be going through belongs to you, Lord. Thank you for being our defender. We love you. Inhabit the praises of your people in this place this morning, Lord Jesus. It's in your precious, holy, and most powerful name we pray. Let's give the Lord some praise this morning. Come on. Surrounds me. There's 
nothing to fear now. There's nothing to fear now for my sake. So when I fight, I fight on my knees with my hands lifted high. Oh God, the battle belongs to you. And every fear I lay at your feet, I'll see through. stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows. You win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. And almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power
Let's pray together. Lord, we love you. Thank you for this gathering as we've come together to worship you, to welcome your presence, Lord, into our lives. And Lord, thank you for your great love for us and, and restoring us back to the heart of the Father and giving us a purpose to live and serve. Lord, as we watch this videos of missionaries that we support in Ukraine, God, I pray that it would just be a great and powerful reminder of what you've called us all to do, whether it's in our home, our community, our church, our state, our country, or even out of the country, Lord. Lord, lead us. Let us serve you in, in, in the way you've called us to serve you. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. You guys can have a seat and take a watch. Let's watch the video together. Dear partners and friends, we want to thank you for your faithful prayers and for your financial support. As you know, 17 days ago, our lives have changed in a blink of an eye. Russia has attacked our country, bombed our cities uh, at 5 o'clock in the morning on the 24th of February. Right now, many of our cities lay, lay in ruins. Um, many, many lives are lost. The count is probably in thousands. Uh, our churches, our network of churches are all around Ukraine, and we're trying hard to respond to the challenges our communities are facing. In some of the cities like Kharkiv, the devastation is mind-blowing. The whole residential areas have been bombed by Russian planes and rockets. So our church there is sheltering and uh, feeding people who are left without roof over their head. They're helping uh, people to get on the trains and move to the west. In a number of other cities where we have our churches, uh, we have transit points where refugees who are moving to the West are stopping to get sleep, to get some food, and to keep moving on. So there's a lot of work going on, humanitarian work going on all around Ukraine, and our church are very much part of it. And we don't only share the food and the roof with the people, but we also share with them the most important message of hope. In the midst of where we are, uh, the hope is in, in great demand, in a great shortage, and it's, it's very important. And that's why we'll stay here through the war, because we feel it's important to bring to people the message of the gospel. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Truly, I say to you, as you did it to one of these least of these my brothers and sisters, you did it to me. Thank you so much for partnering with us in this difficult uh, time of war in Ukraine, um, this really horrible and tragic circumstances for many, many people in Ukraine. Uh, please continue to pray for our people, that God will protect them. Uh, pray, please, for our military forces, as they will stand against the uh, big enemy, and they will be able to push him back uh, to his land. And uh, please pray that uh, war in Ukraine will be ended soon. Uh, thank you so much for your prayers, for your support. Uh, in Christ's name, we pray together we stand. Amen. It is important for us as a church family to always recognize that we are not the sum total of the kingdom of God. And as a church family, it's important for us to recognize and acknowledge that there are churches, family members, literally across the globe, striving to tell their neighbors and friends about Jesus. And it is a joy and a thrill to be partnered with several of them around the world. The Michaeluts, whom you've heard from, uh, are being supported by this church, by your giving. Um, they are in the middle of, they're in the middle of war. And 
there is so much that we can be doing alongside of them, primarily in laboring in prayer. And if there was anyone on the planet who believed in prayer, it's us who are followers of Jesus. And so what I want to do to sort of begin our time is, is I want to pray for them. I want to create some space to, to pray and labor on behalf of our friends and family there. They welcomed their granddaughter last week, uh, Brianna. She was born. She's healthy. She's got a head full of hair, and, um, and it seems mom, mom and dad are doing great, so we praise God for that answer to prayer. Um, and so now I want us to take some time to pray for them and turn our attention to the Lord's mercy uh, that he might bring an end to this, and if he doesn't, that he would strengthen them for the road ahead. Let's pray. Father, I'm reminded of the words that you spoke to Isaiah concerning Israel when he wrote, but now thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba in exchange for you, because you are precious in my eyes and honored, and I love you. I give men in return for you, peoples in exchange for your life. Fear not, for I am with you. I will bring your offspring from the east and from the west. I will gather you. I will say to the north, give up. To the south, do not withhold. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the end of the earth. Bring everyone who is called by my name whom I created for my glory, whom I formed and made. Lord, would this be so in Ukraine? Would this be so amongst the Michaluk? Strengthen their hearts, grant them courage, continued courage, and Father, give them perseverance in these long days. Would you create life in the midst of the destruction and would you cause and allow your church to explode? We pray also for our brothers and sisters in Russia who are living under an oppressive regime in such darkness and uncertainty. Father, you, I pray that you would not leave yourself without a witness there, but that you would, in fact, increase your witness, increase the glory due to your name, increase your church, build her. Because Lord, all of us are in your service as those who joyfully go about doing what you tell us to do. So would you lead us to know how to pray? Lead us to know how to wage warfare alongside of our brothers and sisters. And Father, would you bring peace in the midst of this war? We do pray all of these things in the name of Christ and for his sake. And all God's people say it. Amen, amen, amen. Well, family, good morning. It is good to be with y'all this morning. Those who are here, those joining us online, thank y'all so much. Uh, we're going to hop into the book of Ephesians uh, this morning, chapter 4. So if you, have a, if you have a copy of God's Word, meet me in chapter 4, verse 17. Uh, you'll have to excuse my voice. <clears throat> I officiated a wedding last night without a microphone and then preached this morning and got happy. So I'm, uh, I am uh, going to try to do my best. And uh, as they used to say in my church growing up, pray for me and I'll pray for you. We're going to continue in our series, Walk Worthy, looking at what Paul has to say to the Ephesian believers in chapter 4, verses 17 through 24, and what it looks like to live in accordance to what we believe. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 through 24. When you get to verse 17, give me a oh yeah. If you need a minute, say, hold up, brother. I heard something. <laughs> Let's press on anyhow. 
Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17, hear the word of the Lord. Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy, to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learn Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And before considering it, we should pray. Let's pray. Father, would you bless the reading, the hearing, and the doing of your word. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Amen. I woke up this week to some incredibly sad and terrible news. I learned this week that Tom Brady is coming out of retirement. (laughs) Just when I thought greatness was out the door and somebody else has their moment in the sun, It appears that Tom has had enough time at home with Giselle and the kids and has decided to come back for another year of football. I was thinking this week as I was incredulous at the news about a phrase that the New England Patriots employed to describe their expectations as an organization. They referred to the way of being and moving and the way in which they expected people to live within that organization as the patriot way. The patriot way, of course, was the blueprint. And whether you'd been there five years or you were coming in new, you were expected to live according to the patriot way. Growing up as an Alabama fan, many of us are familiar with Nick Saban's expectations for his players. There's a way in which you're supposed to move through and conduct yourself while in the program. Many of us Bama fans understand that that is a reference to the process. Trust the process. For those who might happen to have the bad fortune of being Auburn fans, During the Gene Chizik years and the Gus Malzahn years, there was a phrase, again, to describe what was expected of you within the organization, and that phrase was, all in. There was a way of being that one must learn in order to belong to a family group or organization. In your family, you have these norms and expectations. You have a way of being. Last week, I believe I scared a church member when they heard me yelling for Nicole, my assistant. They looked up horrified and wondering what in the world Nicole did to warrant me yelling at her. Little did they know that's how we communicate in my house. Whenever my mother or sisters, we wanted to get each other's attention, we would scream and yell through the house. And actually, I am loud when I'm happy. I get very quiet when I'm angry. There's a way of moving in the house and even in our offices these days where we're learning what it means to be together, to live, and to work. Your work culture has a way of moving and being. There are rewards for moving along with the culture, and there are sometimes punishments for moving against it. This church 
has silent ways of being. Expectations for how we as a family of God shall live. This Ephesian church in chapter 4 is no different. What Paul is doing is he's teaching these Ephesian believers what it means to live in the household of God when that is often contrary to how they would naturally behave. They must learn to live in this house if they are to be all that God has called them to be. There is only one major complicating factor. It is their past. It is the past experiences that influence how they regard one another. It's the past voices that they've listened to that continue to inform not only their thoughts and their speech. It's the past mistakes and regrets, past loves, past losses, and for us. What often hinders us living according to how Christ expects us to live? What gets in the way of us not living fully in free lives if it is not our past? our past negative experiences that cause us to regard anyone in these particular situations in a certain way. The past voices that have cautioned us to be careful and those voices for the better and for the worse continue to inform even how we see ourselves. Our past mistakes and regrets that we think back on often replaying them in our minds like a highlight reel that heap shame and guilt upon us that cause us to hide from one another and never experience intimacy. Past loves, past losses, the lives we wished we never lived and the lives that we wish we could live again. In the Christian life, many people believe that salvation is the finish line. It's not. It's the starting line. And we spend the rest of our lives growing up into what it means to belong to God and to live in his family. But our past tends to be the thing that holds us back from fully engaging and realizing the blessed gift of being with one another and with God. So how do we consider our past? How do we get to the point where we see our past as an Ebenezer, as a stone of remembrance that we might look back to to see just how far God has brought us rather than the operating system by which we continue to function today? Are y'all with me this morning? I've got four quick points. That's a lie. Lord, forgive me. I've got four points for us this morning. (laughs) Considering Paul's words to the Ephesians here in verses 17 through 24, where I believe he's encouraging these Gentile Christians to walk away from their past and into this life together. The first point is an admonition and an imperative. It is as follows. Walk away from your past. Walk away from your past. Paul in verse 17 begins with a command speaking with the weight, the force, and the authority of Jesus. And what does he say? He says, you must not walk as the Gentiles do. This is the negative corollary to the positive uh, aforementioned uh, 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 command in verse 1 of chapter 4. When he says, I, therefore, prisoner of Christ Jesus, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. Now he's saying, uh, now I'm telling you, don't walk like the Gentiles do. This Ephesian church would have been a multi-ethnic, multicultural, intergenerational church. Ephesus was a cultural crossroads. It was a, it was a trade route crossroads. And in the backdrop was one of the seven wonders of the world, which was the temple of Artemis. 
and the worship and the idol worship that happened there, you've got people from all walks of life now living in the same place. It's really interesting, and we need to make this distinction that what Paul is doing here is he hasn't forgotten that these are Gentiles, nor does he flatten their ethnicity. But rather, he sees the folks inside of this house, this Ephesian church, as a new humanity, as one new creation that is differentiated from the Gentiles he references here as those who still live according to the world. And so, many of these Gentiles, Paul says in chapter 2, verses 11, this is who you were. If you were to go to chapter 2, verse 11, therefore, you who were uncircumcised according to the circumcised, he says that you were uh, uh, without God, without hope in all of the world, far from God, alienated from the covenants and the promises and the strangers. He says that's who you were. That's your old life. That's your past. Now I'm encouraging you to not live that way anymore. In other words, don't go back. I've shared this illustration before, but I just love it. It's so sticky in terms of what the Christian life is like. In many ways, the Christian life and what it means to grow up into the image and likeness of Jesus is like a five-year-old soccer game, right? You got a five-year-old soccer game. You got the kids who show up at the game. They got, they got the, the shin guards up to their hips. The jerseys are down to their ankles. Mom, dad, coach spends the entire first half of the game saying, hey, little Johnny, hey, Tyreek, hey, Monica, y'all run that way. So Tyreek and Johnny and Monica, they get out there and they play in and all of a sudden the whistle blows and they begin to run that way. There's your goal. So cool. They begin to run and try to work their way in very sloppy and uncoordinated and uh, very messy ways to try to score a goal. Then halftime comes and you eat your animal crackers and your little snacks and such and a Capri Sun or what have you. And then all of a sudden, at the second half, you flip sides of the field. So you've just told Johnny and Tyreek and Monica to run this way. And all of a sudden, in the second half, they're having to run this way. So little Johnny and Tyreek and Monica are like, cool, second half, we're running this way. And coach is like, no, run this way. <coughs> Our lives before Jesus encounters us to transform us, we're all oriented to running this way headlong into self-desire and sin. And then Jesus encounters us, he flips us around and he tells us to run this way. And we run this way for a little while and it seems to work and it's good and it's joyful, but the inertia of who we used to be can be strong and we're tempted to run back. Paul is essentially saying to these Gentile converts, don't go back, don't revert, don't look behind you. I need you to run this way. Why? Because ultimately where they were was a hopeless life. Look at it with me. Look at verses two and three. Paul's doing some really interesting things with the language here. The end of 17 of chapter 4, rather, end of 17 of chapter 4, he says that they were futile in their minds. There's futility in their minds. Before I explain it, let me show it. John of Damascus says it this way. He says, for their life has neither finish line nor goal, but is carried out in futility, meaning there's an aimlessness. Dave Matthews said it this way, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we'll die. In that, there's a purposelessness to life. In other words, they don't live on purpose because they have none. He then goes on to say that they're darkened in their understanding. They cannot understand, ascertain, or see God. That the things of God and the things of holiness and beauty and righteousness feel and seem like an affront to them. They cannot understand God. And then third, their ignorance. He says that they're ignorance that is in them. And, and, and this ignorance is, is not sort of a willful, sinful ignorance. It is rather an aimlessness. So in other words, their thinking has no point. Their minds are darkened and cannot understand truth and beauty. And third, their life is aimless. He says, that's who you were. Don't go back. 
Now let me confess before all of you that had you known me between the years of 2002 and 2006, you would be like, there's no way that that man is a pastor. Because the things that marked my life were deceit, debauchery, licentiousness, and envy. And I recognize and understand that there are some of you who, who can't, who, who won't be able to listen to me anymore because I've just pulled the curtain back and the Wizard of Oz has no clothes, essentially. But I will never be anything other than honest with you. When I think back to who I used to be, there is great shame. There is great guilt. But I also see how far Jesus has brought me. But I also look back on those days and I remember how lonely and hopeless and fraught with peril. I remember how dark those days were compared to the light that I walk in and I hear Paul's words in times when I'm willing to, to or when I'm uh, tempted to go back. I hear Paul's words, don't go back. This is really important to Paul because he emphasizes these words in at least one other place in Romans chapter one, verses 21 through 22. He says it this way there. He says, for although they knew God, meaning that they were aware of God's existence, this is not saving faith. They knew God in the creation. They could ascertain him there. That for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools. Paul's admonishment and mine to you is walk away from your past. Who you used to be is of no use in who Jesus is making you to be other than a stone of remembrance to look back on and see just how much work he's done in your life. There are voices and people that are living rent-free in our heads and our minds. And there are experiences that we carry running highlight reels over and over and over again that prevent us from living in the fullness of life <coughs> and tempt us to go back. But here's the truth. We cannot become the people God wants us to be if we're still clinging to who we were before Jesus met us. Are y'all all right? Walk away from your past. And then Paul gives us a clue of what happens if we choose not to. Second point, what happens when we don't? So what happens when we choose not to walk away from the sin and self-indulgence that so easily entangles us? He says, essentially, a couple things happen. One, he says that their hardness of heart, at the very end of, chapter, of verse 18, he says their hearts get hard. That word there in the Greek is the word perosis. It means a callous. It means uh, their hearts are calloused. And when I read that in the Greek, my mind immediately went to one of my guilty pleasures. I don't spend money on a lot of things, but there is one thing that I absolutely love that I will splurge on, and that is a good pedicure. <laughs> I love going with my wife to get pedicures. I love it. Because you get there, you get the feet, you put the feet in the water, and some of you ladies like sit in scalding hot water, and I don't know how y'all do that, but like I get in there, she got to turn the cold water on me, and then, you know, my feet soak a little bit. She come out, you know, she clip toenails and whatnot, and then, you know, they put the scrub, and they give you the scrub, and then they bang the calves. Y'all know what I'm talking about, give you the leg massage. It's wonderful. And then they put your feet in, in the bags and just let them steam for a little while. And you walk out there and it's, you just smooth. But the thing that I love, my, the, my, my, the worst part of the entire pedicure, ladies, y'all know what I'm talking about, is when they come out and they start shaving them calluses. They bring that mug out. I immediately go on my phone because I don't want to see what's about to happen. The calluses, they start shaving out. They start shaving them off. They start shaving them off. Next thing you know, it looks like it's snowing in the bottom of this tub. Thank you, babe. It looks like it's snowing in the bottom of this tub, just shaving calluses off. And by the time she gets done, that callus on the side of your toes, fellas, if you ain't never had it before, you know, it takes your feet a little while to get used to. Your feet can get kind of sore, but they're going to be buttery smooth. It's almost as if they're taking a cheese grater and moving it through butter. That's a bit, a bit like what it is. 
but they shave those calluses all the way down until it's smooth again. What happens when we refuse to turn away from our former life is that our hearts continue to get calloused. They don't feel like they should. We're not convicted of sin like we should be. That layer after layer after layer after layer after layer after layer gets pressed on our own hearts and minds so that we are no longer hearing the voice of the Spirit of God. He says if you choose to not turn away from your past, your heart gets hard. Second, what happens? You become alienated from God. You become far away from God in many ways. This is the reality for so many believers that I talk to today. The calls and the mess in the meetings that I take, man, I just feel really far from God. And some days I just don't care. I feel really far from God and I don't really know what to do about it. And in many ways, there's so much of our hearts that are, have grown so calloused and hard or we're still allowing a narrative that used to exist to inform how we view ourselves and our neighbor. And third, what happens, and he'll go into this here in a moment, is that we get stuck in our old self. We get stuck in our old self. <clears throat> In the Hebrew Old Testament, there are three words that the Hebrew writers use uh, constantly to describe what sin is. Those three words are sin, transgression, and iniquity. Sin is the general word for sin. It's a general word for missing the mark, for going against the things in the will of God. Secondly, the word is transgression, and transgression is willful sin. This is the type of sin that you go into knowing it's wrong, but instead of asking for permission, you know you're going to ask for forgiveness on the back end. You ain't got to nod your head or shake it. I know you do it because we all do it. Guilty. Transgression is the sin that you know is wrong. You do it anyway, but on the back end, your heart is pricked and you do feel guilt. You feel shame. You're repentant over that sin. But third is iniquity. This is the sin that happens that we have done so frequently, our hearts are so callous, we've become nose blind to our sin. We're not sensitive to it. We don't, we don't feel it. And we're at the point where we no longer feel conviction over that sin. It is the sin that comes that's unrepentant and unconfessed. Sin, transgression, and iniquity. Essentially, what Paul is saying is your former life was full not only of sin, not only transgression, but marked by iniquity. That's why David says, in iniquity did my mother give me birth. It's why when we read about the word of Christ and his application of his life and ministry to our life, it's not just that he took, bore our sin and our shame and he removed our transgression, but he separated our iniquity as far as the east is from the west. When we don't walk away from our past, then sin, transgression, and iniquity mark our life. And here's the thing. Paul's already told them two chapters earlier that Jesus has come to rescue them and us from sin, from transgression, from iniquity, so that you and I might be free. You and I are free. I'm by myself. That's okay. You and I are free. Now, when you've lived bound, freedom doesn't feel like freedom. When you've lived according to your past, it is hedonism and self-indulgence that feels like freedom. It is walking a straight and narrow road that feels like prison. But the reality is, is that a life of self-indulgent, self-willed debauchery is actually a prison. It ain't freedom. I was thinking yesterday, we were... Um, um, our students had D-Now this weekend, and I'm thinking about these conversations I've had with students over the last 15 years working in student ministry, and quite often, the, the number one reason why students choose not to follow Jesus in their teens is because they say, look, I got the rest of my life to serve Jesus. 
I just want to have a little fun right now, and Jesus is a divine buzzkill. I really just want to go out. I want to live my life. I want to do what I do, and I don't want to feel bad about it. <clears throat> In other words, I want to do me. Think about the temple cult of Artemis. Think about the temple cults of these false animistic gods in, 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 in Ephesus. Think about all the cultures and the life of a Gentile that's marked by these various things outside of who God is. And what you get is you get a culture that says, essentially, listen to your heart. And secondly, you do you, boo. <laughs> but the reality is that many of us who spend our lives trying to be unencumbered from power and authority to live autonomous lives will find that autonomous, self-indulgent lives, doing what you want to do, when you want to do it, it's actually a prison. You begin to hate yourself. You begin to make concessions. You begin to become someone that you never thought you'd be, but you're free. You're your own woman. You're your own man. I can remember waking up some mornings, looking at myself in the mirror, thinking to myself, my mom and dad did not raise me this way. Who have I become? When I think and consider what my past has been like, the guilt and the shame that's there, I'm thinking to myself, what in the world did I do? Paul says, such were some of you. But he offers them a different encouragement and encourages them to remember. Third, the encouragement is to walk freely unto Jesus. Walk freely unto Jesus. Now watch this. This is really interesting. In verse 17, he says their minds are futile. In verse 18, he says their understanding is darkened. And he also says that they're ignorant. These are three phrases that refer to the mental faculties of Gentiles far away from God. Then you become, in verse 20, he says, but that is not the way you learn Christ. Paul's dictating this letter in this prison. He gets happy all of a sudden. And then in verse 21, he says, assuming that you've heard about him. And he's not saying, um, I assume you've heard about him because Paul is the one who planted this church. He's been preaching the gospel for at least a year, likely three. Like these folks know and have learned Jesus because he taught them. So he goes on to say, this is not how you, watch this, learned Christ. He then say that you've heard about him and that you were taught in him. So you learned, you heard, you were taught, which is the direct corollary to darkness and understanding, ignorant in mind, futile in thinking. Paul seems to have a laser focus and vision on how we think. I like this because how we tend to think and how we refer, rehearse history tends to be how we believe, and it tends to be how we behave. If you've got a narrative in your past that is always running and always informing who you are, then what will happen is that you will live out of that in present life. It's one of the reasons why Paul is saying, walk this way. You must no longer walk like this. This is not how you were learned. This is not how you were taught. This is not what you heard. In other words, I think what he's trying to get us to see is that a renewed mind results in a renewed life. If we're tired of living in the prison of a past, in the prison of our own self-indulgence, in the prison of our poor decisions, we can't just try hard. I've known many Christians try really hard and still be trapped in cycles of prison, sin's prison. We need a renewed mind, a renewed life. It's the product of a renewed mind. Paul is saying if essentially we are to walk free, which means that you have to understand who you are. That's not who you are anymore. This is who you are. And I need some of y'all to stop lying on my church members. 
I need some of y'all to stop telling lies to people that I love. Meaning the things that you tell yourself that are not true. I need you to cut that out because you lying on my friend. I need some of y'all to begin to rehearse the truth about who you are now, not who you used to be. Because this is who you are. You are loved, chosen, adopted, the masterpiece of God. That Christ left heaven to come to earth, to put on human flesh and mortality, to take your place. Jesus ain't dying for junk. Stop lying on my friend. Paul is essentially saying, that's who you used to be. This, this is who you are. And it begins with a renewed mind, fourth and finally. But here's what happens when we do that, when we, when we actually believe and we actually do this, when we turn away from our past and begin to walk headlong into who Christ has made us to be, what happens is transformation. That's what happens. Transformation happens. Now, let me take a side road briefly. Back in the late 90s and early 2000s, you could tell that a movie was going to be a blockbuster success if at some point during the movie there was going to be a great reveal of someone's face being peeled off and being revealed to be somebody that they weren't. This is typified no greater than the 1997 blockbuster smash hit Face Off with Nick Cage and John Travolta, wherein there's literally these dudes' faces come off and they swap them. Also, the Men in Black franchise, which is a C-level franchise in my opinion, don't at me, was notorious for the grand reveal of certain people not having the face that you thought they would. Can't forget about Mission Impossible. All those Tom Cruise movies, arguably the greatest movie franchise of all time, and just about every single movie, somebody's face came off. We can't forget about Jim Carrey and the mask, quite literally a mask being taken off. Paul says that transformation happens when we begin to focus on who God has made us to be rather than who we were, and that the imperative begins for us in verse 22, to put off the old self and to put on the new self. In other words, there's an aspect to putting off the old man that involves us taking off our masks, who we used to be, how people used to think about us, the image and facade that we tried to get people to see Faking and playing games so that you are thought well of. This old life that brought its identity of its own, you've got to take it off because you've got a better and greater identity now. And instead, putting on, there's this clothing yourself in Christ Jesus and stepping into this new humanity. Think of it this way. When you were children, well, let me speak for myself, I don't want to assume when I was a child, I used to play in my father's clothes all the time. I put his jacket on, and me and my brother would be sitting there, and we'd be slapping each other in the face with the sleeves of his jacket. <laughs> and then I'd have the pants on, and I got this jacket on, and I got his shoes on. He wore a size 10 shoe, and, and I'm, I got the pants. I'm tripping all over myself, holding the pants up because they're so big, and the shoes don't fit, and the jacket doesn't fit. I remember thinking to myself, I'll never grow up into this. And then now, if you know my father, I'm almost twice the man that my dad is. I'm 12 sizes in a bigger coat than he is. He's still in a 10. I wear a 15-size shoe. I know y'all don't see how big my feet are. You ain't got a front. But when I think about what it means to grow up into the image and the likeness of my father, that's what it looks like to be in the Christian life, is to grow up into what it means to be clothed in the righteousness of Jesus there's an aspect where our theology has to match the messages that we preach to ourselves, meaning that when Jesus says through Paul to put on the Lord Jesus Christ, like quite literally as if you would put on a bear skin or a tiger skin, as you would put on the flesh of another human being, we're, we're to put on Jesus like a garment, and that garment is one of righteousness and holiness. Let me put it this way. 
when we begin to walk with Jesus and when we come to saving faith, there is a punctiliar moment. There is a moment in time when we become justified before God. And Christians love that word justification. It is a good theological word. We should know it. But it supposes that God is a dispassionate judge who regards us as a lowly defendant who just escaped the verdict by the skin of our teeth. But at the same time justification happens, so too does adoption. So not only does the judge let you off, but the judge then brings you into his family. Here's the reality. God in Christ doesn't just let you off scot-free. God in Christ actually likes you. Do you hear me? I know we say God loves me, but God likes you too. He has adopted you. You're being declared righteous and he's adopted you. And for that reason, Every step in your life as a Christian is one where you are clothed in the righteousness of Christ Jesus. But these are clothes that we're always growing up into and we never fill them out. They're shoes that we're always stepping into, but we never fill them out. This is who you are. I need y'all to stop lying to yourself and we must become proficient at preaching the gospel to ourselves. You got to preach this message to yourself, baby, because this world and Satan wants nothing more than for you to be trapped in a prison of sin and patterns of thinking of your past instead of walking into the freedom that is, I'm clothing myself in Christ Jesus, which means that I am not my sin. I'm not the sum total of my worst mistakes. I am righteous and God regards me highly. And if I'm righteous, then that means that Satan himself, there is no power in hell, there's no scheme in man, there's no height, no depth, no link, no breath, no power there is, nor to come that can separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And if you get to the point where you start to doubt that, I just need you to go back and read Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 in the Greek when Paul calls you the poema of God, the masterpiece of God. Satan, you call me trash. He calls me a masterpiece. Get behind me. Let me walk in this freedom that's right in front of me. There is a putting on of Christ Jesus that that implies and necessarily means that we have to tell the truth. We've got to tell the truth. Put off the old self. Forget the past. Leave it behind. And how do we begin to step in? We rehearse the truth. Because here's what happens. We as a church and the global church of Christ will never fully realize what it means to live in unity until we do this. Because we can't love each other if we're looking at each other with suspicion and hurt and we're slow to forgive. If you jump back up to the beginning of chapter four, we will never become verses two and three without this humble, gentle, patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. We will not and cannot become the people God is calling us to be if we continue to live in the past. I love the picture in the prophets, and I'm over time, and I don't care. I'm preaching. Y'all stuck. (laughs) I love the picture that the prophets paint about this reality of God's people with God. It is the picture of them beating their swords into plowshares. These weapons of harm and destruction, that there's peace, there's so much peace that there's no longer a functional job for an instrument of war. So now an instrument of destruction gets repurposed into an instrument of cultivation. I'm preaching, y'all don't hear me. The tools of war now get transformed into tools of peace. The tools that were once used to kill are now tools that now are giving life. The tools that were used to destroy are now tools that are being used to build up. And he says that the peace that I bring will be such that you will beat your swords into plowshares and your spears into pruning hooks. There is a necessary disarmament that has to happen 
where you go into the locker with all of the firearms, where you go into the hangar with all of the missiles and the jets, where you go into the storehouses where you've kept the instruments of war and you willingly disarm yourself and turn those weapons of destruction into weapons of cultivation, that is when we will begin to have unity and peace. But as long as we hang on to hurt and hate, and as long as we hang on to suspicion, and as long as we hang on to those voices and those experiences that still inform how we see our brother, we will never get to the point where we see this. Christ has a better way for us quickly, very quickly. How do we get here? What does, what is the result of walking away from our past, stepping into Jesus? The result is transformation. And here's a, here's a, uh, if you really want to be uh, transformed, there, there's four steps. There's four. There's an equation here that Ray Ortland gives that I think is supremely helpful. And ultimately, this this uh, this trend, this uh, equation is helpful because it gives us an idea of what we need throughout our entire Christian lives to grow. We need gospel. We need the announcement of the good news of King Jesus. We need the announcement of the good news of King Jesus who took our place on a cross, who rose on the third day, and who's going to take us home. And we've got to preach this message to ourselves. This ain't a message, y'all, that you only preach three times a year on Christmas, Mother's Day, and Easter. This is a message that you have to preach to yourself every single day. Otherwise, we become Pharisees. When we become the very thing that Christ saved us from, which is we are not saved or made righteous or brought into right relationship with God by what we do, but what's been done for us. We need that message often. We also need grace. I love that word grace. Yes, it's kindness, but it's also this word macrothymia, patience, long-suffering. We need grace, dealing tenderly and gently with one another. And the reason we need grace is because we're all going to blow it at some point in time. And the reality is none of us own anything. I want you to know, friends, that I don't own nothing in this church. I've got nothing I'm trying to protect. I, I don't have any ground that I'm trying to be protective over as if you belong to me. You don't belong to me. When I think about why we fight each other, we fight each other over things that we don't, that don't belong to us. If I were to walk out here today and get into an accident and go and be with Jesus, y'all going to cry for a couple days, y'all going to be sad, but then y'all going to be eating potato salad, going on spring break at the beach, y'all ain't going to remember me. And ultimately, all of us are going to go be with Jesus one way or another, If people ain't going to remember us, why am I fighting over something that's going to live beyond me and that likely will continue to change apart from me? I got no skin in the game. What I'm invested in is for you and I to be transformed deeper into the image of Christ Jesus. And in order to do that, you need gospel, you need grace, and you need space. We need space. We need space. We need to create margin for people to mess up, margin for people to doubt, margin for people to get it wrong. And instead of jumping into it down their throats, well, you don't believe correctly. No, you sit with people and you listen to them. You create space for people to question and to wrestle and to grow. Not everything in life has a right answer. And sometimes you just need to shut your mouth and be with somebody in presence. But the last thing is time. Time. I was uh, officiated a wedding yesterday in Birmingham, and during the rehearsal dinner, the father of the groom told this story about his grandfather, that uh, his grandfather had, um, was married to his grandmother for over 60 years. And uh, his grandmother, at one point in time, had had some health issues, and they had walked through a really scary situation. She had bounced back from it, and on this particular occasion, the grandfather's sitting in a chair in the living room, and his grandmother's in the kitchen cooking. And there's all these grandkids that are sitting all around. (laughs) And out of nowhere, he says, you know, these grandkids are sitting like with their, they're going steady at this point. This is in the 60s, so they're going steady with some folks. And who they're going steady with, they're all sitting in there, and he says, you know, you young people think you know about love. But I've been married to that woman in there for 62 years. 
and I'm just now figuring out what love is. I think there's an aspect where we're all growing up into what it means to follow Jesus and to be together. And I don't care if you're 21 or if you're 91, we all have space to grow because these clothes will never fill until we stand before God and he fills them for us. And so I think for us, there is the imperative and the very important reality that there's a particular way in which that God would desire for us to live and behave. And I want to encourage us to lay down our weapons, lay down our fighting instruments and pursue peace. At the end of every sermon, every time God's word is opened, I believe God's word demands a response. So this morning, we're going to respond to God's word by coming to the table. But before we come to the table, I want to create some space. I want to create some space for us to respond to the word of the Lord, to respond to what he's doing in our hearts by the spirit, but also respond in confession and repentance so that we might be found worthy to sit at this table with Jesus because what we're about to do is we're about to eat a meal with Jesus, sitting at the table with him, supping with him. So let's take the next few moments. Let's be still. Let's hear from God. Let's be obedient and let's confess where he asks us to. Lord, we do love you. We do worship and adore you. And you do mean more to us than anything in this world. And as we come to the table this morning, we remember what you've done for us, that you have indeed brought us from a mighty long way. And we remember that work, but we also look ahead to when that work will be finished. So be with us now in this moment we ask. Amen. So as we come to dine with Jesus, we go back to that upper room long ago on the night when he was betrayed, when eating the Passover meal, he reached over and took bread and he broke it. He said, this is my body broken for you. He said, as often as you eat of this meal, remember me. You may take and eat. Later in the meal, he took the cup, took the wine and he poured it. He said, this is the blood of my new covenant poured out for you. As often as you drink it, Remember me, you may take and drink. As we commit and renew our vows to you, Jesus, strengthen us by your grace, I ask. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.
where Jesus trades our shameful victory. So we sing hallelujah for his love that welcomes all the broken ones. For though our sin and ocean fill, his grace goes deep. Grace goes deeper still. There is no stain. tasted death and bitter scorn so we could taste the goodness of the Lord so we sing hallelujah for his love that welcomes all the broken ones for the Say the Lord is good, amen. amen. Hey, thank y'all so much for being with us. Uh, we are grateful for y'all, both those who are here and those who are online uh, who are listening and our stream just went down. So we'll, you'll hear this later. We're gra- glad y'all are here. Uh, if you're here this morning, maybe you need an uh, extra touch. Maybe you need somebody to pray for you. Perhaps you just need somebody to listen to create a little space for you. We've got a prayer room here in the back that we'd love uh, to commend to you in the event that that's something that would be a blessing to you. Our benediction this morning is going to be very simple. Just a few words out of Isaiah 43. In verse 4, when God says to Isaiah, to Israel, and also to you, you are precious in my eyes. You are honored. And I love you. Go in the grace and the peace of the Lord Jesus Christ. We love you. Have an incredible week. Great work, y'all. Thank you, Pastor Jason. If during today's worship, uh, in the singing of songs, or in the reading and teaching of God's Word, something has stirred inside of you and your heart, and you want to learn a little bit more about what a life with Jesus can look like, let me encourage you to go to our website or click on that QR code and go to the Connect card, and one of our team members will be in touch with you shortly. Uh, If you follow that link, you can also uh, meet 
with one of our care ministry uh, members who are there available to speak with you and pray with you. And you can even schedule a meeting, whether that's on campus here in Roswell, Georgia, or through a video conference call. Well, uh, we want to thank you for being with us this morning once again as we uh, continue this journey through the book of Ephesians and go into the week remembering that you are a much-loved child of the Most High King. God bless you.